good afternoon all. I'm um, presenting on behalf of my team, which uh, consists of myself, uh, um, Associate Professor Martin Leary, Professor Chun from St. Vincent's Hospital, and uh, Professor Milan Brand from the RMIT University. Um, we are based in Carlton. Uh, our center is called Ad uh, Advanced Manufacturing Free Center, which is basically a uh, 3D printing facility. Um, which is made up of about, about $25 million has been invested in the facility and um, have lots of technologies to do with 3D printing, but also to complement 3D printing processes and all the applications that we are working on um, currently. So uh, to, to just to go through the range of printers and technologies we have, we have lots of polymer technologies, um, especially for polyjet printing, we have the basics, uh, basic printers, object printers, but we also have uh, the uh, J750, which is extensively used these days for um, creating, uh, creating colorful anatomical models for surgical planning and demonstration. Um, and then there are metal printers that we have, uh, SLM solutions, uh, 250 and 125HL, which are the different sizes of printers, um, and the new craft machine, which is uh, LMD, which is uh, laser cladding 3D printing uh, process, but it, it can also do laser welding and cutting. And there's other technologies that complement our 3D printing um, processes, which include conventional CNC manufacturing, there's metrology lab, which we use for quality control, uh, and there's uh, a CAD lab, which we use for design and simulation. Work to support all our 3D printing projects. Um, at the, the focus of AMP at the moment uh, is in three areas. So uh, there's a, a large group working on the design and simulation. So uh, I belong that, to that group and we specifically um, work on developing methodologies um, for designing for additive manufacturing. So we take into consideration all the uh, constraints that are thrown uh, to us by the application but also uh, by the manufacturing processes themselves. Um, then apply these to different applications, for example, aerospace, biomedical, um, tooling, sports, and so on. Um, there's also a group working on optimizing the processes. So all the 3D printing uh, technologies that we have are commercial machines, but uh, we work very hard on optimizing process parameters so that we get an optimum <coughs> uh, uh, output out of, out of these uh, machines. There's also a group working on developing new alloys. Um, and optimizing those alloys. So, for example, uh, as we saw in one of the presentations, that Titan M64 is not the most desirable material for biomedical implants because of the toxicity introduced by aluminium and vanadium. So, there's a group working on specifically developing alloys for biomedical applications, so you don't have these um, bad effects from the material implant uh, implant material itself. And then we are also uh, looking at developing our own machines uh, that cater to specific ap applications. For example. Composite 3D printing is a new emerging area where a lot of aerospace and defense industry is looking into. So we're looking at developing new machines that enable us to print composite parts um, with less manufacturing constraints compared to the current technologies that we have. Coming back to the topic, um, this is basically my PhD project that I did with St. Vincent's Hospital. So Professor Peter Chung from St. Vincent's Hospital had this vision or has this vision to be able to operate on a, operate on a patient. Um, so he will start the surgery, he'll do the scans before and after uh, the bone cancer tumor has been removed. Um, we'll then design and manufacture the implant and provide, and then he then implants it into the patient while he's still um, under anesthesia uh, and on, still on the operating table. So with this vision, uh, we developed a new methodology to design these implants automatically, so we reduce this design time uh, significantly. So currently, uh, there are a few different approaches that are uh, considered while designing these implants. Um, as you see in this slide, most of the uh, osteosarcoma, which is a type of bone cancer, uh, is in the knee area. So conventional um, treatment plan for that is amputation, so the surgeons prefer amputation over any uh, prosthetic um, treatment. But if, if the patient is not happy about the out outcome, they may opt for joint replacement. So they put a mechanical hinge uh, as a treatment. Uh, or if, if it's a more localized um, bone that's affected, then we put standard plate type implants to just to reconstruct the part that's uh, affected by the tumor. Um, the bad effects of these 
Implant strategies include, um, as we saw, bone resorption due to stress shielding, um, and there is a significant removal of natural tissue just to accommodate this bulky implant into the existing uh, anatomy. So again, to reiterate the methodology that we are working on, um, we get the 3D scan from the surgeon before and after the surgery, after he's removed the tumor. We compare the volumes and extract the volume that's missing from the bone, and, and then design a software that will automatically fill this gap with lattice structures, type of implants, um, that are specific, uh, conformal to the geometry of the native bone. Um, they are also optimized according to the local loading conditions, and also they are completely manufacturable using the uh, 3D printing process that is going to, that's going to be used. So uh, we have a patent application pending on this methodology, um, and as I said, the vision is design and manufacturing and implantation during the surgery. So the way this uh, method works is, it takes into account the design volume, uh, the user inputs the loading conditions, uh, the allowable stress for that particular uh, lattice implant, and the manufacturing constraints for that um, process that's going to be used. And then it spits out a lattice structure that is optimized, um, that is conformal to the geometry of the uh, missing volume. It's manufacturable using the 3D printing process that you're using, and also it's optimized to the loading conditions of that particular um, anatomical region. So talking about the manufacturing constraints, um, 3D printing is, a, it, is capable of producing very complex parts, but it still has some constraints. Uh, for example, for lattice structures, it's not desirable to have support structures inside lattice structures because it's, um, it's not feasible to remove them during post-processing. So we treat this as a constraint while, uh, while manufacturing. Um, just to um, find out what's the minimum strut size that can be manufactured and what uh, at what minimum angle it can be manufactured at, we did some experiments to find out that. So we find this green region, which is about 300 micron strut diameter, uh, at about 10 to 20 degrees orientation, is manufacturable. So when the software is automatically generating these lattice structures, it considers this as the minimum threshold. Um, so thus, it makes sure that all the struts in a lattice structure are, man are manufacturable. So whatever struts that are not manufacturable inside the lattice structures are deleted uh, physically uh, by the software, but that may compromise its structural stability. So we use a threshold or a criteria called Maxwell analysis. So Maxwell is just an equation uh, on the top left corner which considers number of struts, number of joints in a lattice structure, and then gives out a factor, factor M, that uh, indicates if the structure is uh, structurally rigid or under stiff. So if you look at the first structure here, it's, we call it as um, under stiff structure. So if you apply loading in any direction, the structure is going to collapse. The structure in B, it's just stiff. So the loading direction shown in the figure um, uh, the structure is capable of sustaining that load. But if you change the loading direction, it may or may not collapse. And the structure on the extreme left-hand corner uh, is over stiff structure. So regardless of the loading direction, the structure will be stable structurally. Um, so if you run through all the lattice structures through this uh, threshold, it will give you a graph of um, red and blue areas. So all the structures that lie above this blue area are over stiff. And all the structures that are below this zero line are uh, under stiff. So the algorithm, again, after running the lattice structure through the manufacturing constraints, uh, runs this analysis and then makes sure that all the structures or the structure that's being tested is over stiff. So regardless of the loading direction, it's not going to collapse. It's a very uh, computationally efficient way of testing the structural rigidity. Uh, but um, so just before I go into more mechanical testing, this is another test that it performs. So as you can see here, so I've, uh, this is the same structure that has been uh, run through this analysis. So if you remove uh, struts that are below 30 degrees in that lattice structure, you'll get the structure on the top. But if you increase the threshold by 20 degrees, you'll get a structure like that, which is basically just vertical struts, which is structurally very unstable. Um, but if you rotate that structure by 45 degrees, you have more chance of getting more uh, elements that pass this test. So what the algorithm does is 
it rotates the structure uh, around x and y axis from 0 to 180 degrees and tries to find out the uh, orientation where maximum number of struts will be manufacturable. Um, so not just building it vertically, but changing its orientation so you get maximum manufacturability. And by getting maximum manufacturability, you also get maximum Maxwell parameter. That means the structure is manufacturable as well as stiff. So at the end, um, so when you start, you get a structure uh, that is over stiff, but not necessarily printable. So it has some horizontal elements. Once you remove those elements, you get a structure that's printable, but maybe under stiff. But after optimization, you get a structure that's both support free or manufacturable, but also over stiff. Um, after it's done this threshold uh, testing, we apply the loading conditions to the model and it then iteratively optimizes that structure to that given loading condition. So, for example, you can specify a level stress for an implant. For example, for titanium, it can be anything below 800 megapascals. Um, and then the uh, algorithm will uh, do some testing on it, mechanical testing on it, and then uh, find out stresses in individual struts. Next iteration, it will try to adjust the sizes of the individual struts and try to neutralize stresses. And then over a number of iteration, it will get to this allowable stress by changing diameters, either reducing the diameter or increasing the diameter. It will get to that solution. Um, so we've tested these structures using composite bones. So the, the picture you see on the left is a composite of epoxy and polyurethane foam, which is supposed to replicate um, cortical and trabecular bone uh, properties. And then we put an implant uh, or two type of implants which have relative density of 40 and 35 percent. So by testing those implants, uh, we can show that these, uh, this methodology can, uh, will not only recover the load carrying capacity, but also will try to replicate the um, stiffness of that composite. So um, it can be applied in real life situations for replacing bone uh, tissue, for example. Um, this is also uh, this, uh, just to show the relation between the theoretical Maxwell condition that we talked about and the actual outcome, which is from mechanical testing, which is Young's modulus. So we can correlate that the stiffness through Maxwell, Maxwell uh, parameter can, uh, can be translated into a physical mechanical property of the implant. Uh, so some of the case studies, so this is the one we did with anatomics. Which is a spinal implant with, uh, for a lady with congenital defect in the spine. Uh, and it was designed from the CT scan. Uh, it's a lattice structure generated automatically. So it's very suitable for mass customization. Um, so you don't need to manually design these lattice structures. Um, and it's so with quite successful uh, surgery and application of this technology. The other one is um, a revision of the heel implant that um, anatomics design. So just by applying this methodology, we were able to reduce the weight from 255 grams to about 90 grams um, and still maintain the structural rigidity of the part. Uh, this is another strategy. So this is um, to replace a large volume of tumor um, inside the bone. So it's actually, the design is actually adaptive um, to the shape of the geometry and also to counter the reaction forces from the nail and you can see that you can also change the density of the lattice structure uh, near the interface zone. So if you want to enhance the osseointegration integration near the interface of the bone and the implant, you can do that simply by specifying a parameter of density you want near the uh, interface. You don't really, really need a high density lattice structure there because you do want to reduce the stiffness of the implant and um, match the stiffness of the implant to the bone. Um, um, so, all the current methods that I use to generate lattice structures type of implants, they use 3D reconstruction from CT scans um, to uh, STL files or 3D files and then convert those 3D files into an implant geometry. So still it is a manual process, so you have to do lots of segmentation, smoothing operations on the CT scans, and it's highly dependent on the user expertise. So it, the outcome may be different from user to user. Uh, but more importantly, in our case, we need the process to be fast, and this is not exactly the way to go because it may take sometimes hours to segment a single um, anatomy. 
There's also lots of smoothing operations which may compromise the um, accuracy of the model, but also it increases the resolution of the uh, file and it then becomes computationally inefficient to process all these 3D smoothed out models. So what we're proposing is going directly from CD scans to lattice structures. So we are anyway converting a slice data into 3D and then again slicing it. So why not just use that slice data to uh, create a slice lattice structure, for example. So what the algorithm does is it lets the, um, uh, the person who is designing the implant visualize the CT scan slice by slice. Um, and then it lets you define the geometries. For example, the tumor here is calcified. So it will be really difficult to automatically segment this uh, if you were to apply automatic segmentation to this. So there will be manual intervention where the surgeon will define the geometry or sorry, the contour of the bone uh, not, uh, manually. And then he'll define the surgical resection boundary. Um, and then this uh, surgical resection boundary is copied to all the slices uh, in that plane. And then it automatically, uh, sorry, you, you can specify the density of the lattice structure on top and bottom where the interface area is. And then it applies to all the slices in that plane and then you get a lattice structure out of it. So that's uh, just way, one way of making lattice structures directly from CT scans. While uh, it's applying these uh, resection boundaries and creating lattice structure, it also is saving a database of CT scan or, or DICOM files, which doesn't have this volume there, which can be used then to reconstruct in 3D and then design um, cutting guides, for example. Um, so it's doing two things at the, uh, at the same time. So what are the advantages of this approach? Um, all these methods that are currently used, they use 3D reconstruction but the, the new method that we are proposing doesn't need to be converted into 3D. So you save a lot of time uh, processing it. Um, so again, you're working with uh, 2D DICOM images, which is just, uh, if you look at the logical structure of those, it's just zero and zeros and ones. Um, so you really need very low computational power and also you, don't, you, you need very um, less data preparation um, because it's, directly generated from the CT scan, the conformity of the lattice structure will be very high. And then the user can control uh, the functional density gradient, for example, or different um, fixation strategies in the scan itself, rather than going back and forth between scan and the 3D file. Um, so you get very uh, compliant design methodology by using this particular method. On that note, I'd like to finish and thank all my uh, colleagues at AMP, and uh, if you have any inquiries about the AMP or just the application or projects we are working on, you're more than welcome to contact us on the emails that are provided there. Thank you.